Okay. So again, welcome to our session tonight on um, God and Other Cultures. And we're going to be talking tonight about uh, Judaism. So I'm going to go ahead and start the screen share. And hopefully you will see um, a blue screen with God and Other Cultures Judaism. Is that what there it is? There it is, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. Um, and in the chat box, uh, you will find a, the, the notes for that if you're interested in the slide notes like I've done before. So I'm um, hoping I let um, Patrick in. Are you there, Patrick? Hope so. Yeah, I see his book is screen there. Okay. So God and other cultures, we're going to talk about Judaism. I want to very quickly uh, put this out in front of you. We have four weeks left, and I would propose that we do this uh, about like this in the next four weeks. If you want to make some adjustments, let me know. We can talk about that. But I would suggest that next week we talk about Islam and then Christianity, and then we're going to talk about uh, Christian denominations and American-made Christianities. That's the nice way to talk about things that have taken a divergence from Orthodox Christianity. And then because we have so many people in our midst around us that are, um, as we talked about in the beginning, uh, they're uh, spiritual but not uh, religious. I want to talk a little bit about what that looks like. Um, in terms of secularism, humanism, people pulling things out of different religions and kind of how we really engage people uh, in those conversations so that they're meaningful and helpful uh, to them and uh, leaving the door open for an invitation to become followers of Jesus. So that's my proposal for us in the next month. And if you have comments or questions or whatever tonight, that would be great if you want to uh, let me know what you think at a different point. That's okay, too. Uh, so um, any any immediate responses you want to make to that this evening? Looks good. Looks good. <laughs> okay. All right. Then we'll move right along just to remind you again that uh, this is our, our basis for doing this, that uh, we want to put this in our hearts and minds this verse the ideas behind this verse that in your hearts revere christ as lord always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have do this with gentleness and respect and the best way to do that is to have a little bit of understanding about where other people might be coming from so tonight uh, we're going to start with uh well, go over Judaism and of course we'll know that we have gone from way over here China Japan that area to clear over here to this very narrow strip of land in the Middle East uh, which is called Palestine Canaan uh, Israel the Middle East um, the Middle East is quite, quite a bit larger than that but this is the area that we've moved to all right, so I want to remind you that also we're switching gears. Um, we have been talking the last month about religious experience in which the white circle uh, represents the world universe, the blue circle represents us, uh, people types, um, and there's a, a sense that somewhere from within the universe uh, we encounter something um, and that's uh, referred to as um, a, a religious experience and that's, that's that green area that something from within the universe uh, gets our attention as people and we seek to be connected with that and Eastern religions look at religious experience that way. And uh, welcome Carol, I, I hope you're able to I'll catch up with this here. I have a blue screen in front of us. And we're just getting started on Judaism. Hi, Carol. Hi. So we're going to move from that Eastern mindset to Western in which the world, the universe exists. 
and we're in that, and yet there is something bigger, greater than that that intersects the universe and us, and this little tiny green area then becomes the realm of religious experience and um, Judaism uh, and the religions that we're going to look at after tonight and the following uh, work in that uh, mindset until we get to the end of the month. Um, and so uh, that's where we're going to start tonight with Judaism. And I want to remind you that if you're not aware of this, that there are basically three ways of being uh, Jewish. One is religiously. Another one is culturally. That one is a little harder for us to grasp here in the United States, especially here in the Northwest. If you lived in New York City or um, New Jersey or some of the big Eastern places, you might run into that. There's also the ethnic piece of being Jewish. And so it's important for you to realize that you can be Jewish in all of these ways or one of these ways. Um, and so these, all th these things all work together to um, become a part of our, our understanding of Judaism. So right now, I want you to fasten your seatbelts because I'm going to try to do 4,000 years of Jewish history in 400 seconds. <laughs> Basically, on your mark, get set, go. Um, and here we go. So we start with Abraham. Abraham is the, uh, considered the father of Judaism because he's the one that God spoke to and said, I want you to go from uh, a foreign land or from your homeland to a foreign land. And um, in that experience, uh, Abraham came to understand that there was one God. And that was totally out of the box from where he, he was at, where he moved to, because that, air, that part of the world at that time was very polytheistic. Uh, there were certain gods for certain locales. And out of that experience, um, the covenant was put in place between God and Abraham, and that became the basis for this relationship. And that covenant bound uh, the people that came from Abraham to God in a, in a long-term sense. And it was frequently renewed. You can read that in the Old Testament. And uh, it did not expire. It was an ongoing thing. And it's important to realize that covenant is not a contract. You know, the other religions tended to be something of a contract religion. If you do this, then God will do that. This God, this, this other God, another God will do this. But you've got to do yours. Otherwise, the, other, the God, whichever one, won't do that God's part. And for um, Abraham to understand to experience God and covenant relationship, which was God saying, regardless of your foils and foibles and problems and sins, I will continue to be a faithful God was a huge deal. And you could not uh, make it um, null uh, or void by breaking any part of it. Um, the beginnings of Judaism uh, were in a sense the uh, two peoples and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that next week when we get to Islam, but quickly, the Jews believed that the covenant was through Abraham and Sarah, but the Muslims believed the correct line was between Abraham and Hagar, uh, Sarah's uh, servant. And so that's where the, in a very rough way, that's where the two religions uh, have this major misunderstanding or disagreement or however you want to say that. Um, Muslims don't use the same images that Jews do. There's no language of covenant and no language of chosen people in their way of looking at things. So to start with, um, we know that Abraham was in the land of Canaan, the promised land, and he lived there for quite a while and he had kids. And uh, because of the famine, uh, they ended up going to uh, through Joseph, they ended up going to um, uh, Egypt, and for a time they were visitors and equals, but after um, a time they became slaves. So under Joseph's time in Egypt as the second in command, they were visitors, but under by the time of Moses, they were slaves. 
And I'm going through this very quickly, hoping that you have a, enough of a sense of the Old Testament to follow along here quickly. And then uh, they cried out to God, and there was the great exodus in which the plagues happened, and then uh, the Egyptians finally let them go, and it culminated with the Passover. Roughly speaking, that was about 1300 to 1200 BC. And during that time of the Exodus, they received the Ten Commandments, which were hugely important to them as far as a code of behavior toward God and toward each other. And also the great Shema was uh, put in place, uh, which comes out of Deuteronomy, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So the Jews were in Egypt, and then they had the Exodus, and they went back to Canaan, the promised land. However, there was a clash of beliefs when the Jews re-entered Canaan. And so we see a history in three parts when they get back there. They had uh, their history under the Judges, and you can read the book of Judges uh, to, to get a sense of that. You have the uh, history under the Kings, um, First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Chronicles, and some of the other books. And then uh, we have David and Solomon establishing the kingdom, the, the um, promised kingdom, and we move from that to the time of the prophets. And uh, that was a time when there were some prophets and some kings, and they kind of overlapped. And, um, like I said, this is 4,000 years and 400 seconds. So here we go. A little bit more. Um, because the Jews did what they did in not following the rules that God had set down from them, they strayed from their relationship with God. Uh, they ended up being taken over by other countries. So the northern kingdom of Israel uh, fell in 2721 BC, and they were taken over by the Assyrians, and they were taken away to Assyria, and Assyria sent other people to live in the land and uh, break the northern part of the kingdom down. And then uh, 150 years later, not quite, the southern kingdom fell to the Babylonians and the leadership only was taken from uh, Israel, the southern kingdom, Judah, to Babylon. And the commoners, the non-leaders, were left in place. During the exile, uh, there were some pretty interesting things that happened because they could not be in Jerusalem any longer. It was the end of the temple worship and the centralized uh, piece of that. Um, and the Tanakh, which is what we would call the entire Old Testament and the Torah, were increasingly important to the folks. And we began to see the rise of the synagogue, which was a more local gathering of Jewish people. And it, it, there, was a require, or there were requirements for a, a synagogue to be put in place. And it took um, 10 male elderly type people of age in order to create a synagogue and wanted to be Jews, of course. Um, after the exile, people began to go back, were allowed to go back um, under Cyrus of Persia. He defeated the Babylonians, and we have the story of Nehemiah and Ezra. And so during that time, about 500 BC, um, Ezra and Nehemiah began to rebuild the temple, and we have those stories in those two books of the Old Testament. And the Torah was um, found, reread, renewed with the people, and they all, there's the story that where they all heard it and tore their clothes and said, oh my gosh, we need to get back to this, and they all agreed, and so they did begin to uh, get back to their roots, as it were, uh, as a, a people who followed God. Um, though the people return to uh, the promised land, their, their identity now was no longer driven by the king as much as it was by the temple. So the focus moved from uh, kingship to the temple during this time, and it was under uh, this time when the Persians fell and uh, the Greeks took over that um, an, an Alexander came in that Hellenism or the Greek form of understanding took over. And this influenced Judaism because uh, 
the Greeks were more open and more tolerant to any religion as long as there wasn't any kind of revolt or problem. And so we see some pretty significant things happen under that time. The most important part of that was that the Hebrew scriptures were translated to Greek, which is what the Septuagint is, and it's still studied today um, and is considered an important part of their um, their training um, as leaders under Jewish thought even today. Um, under Hellenistic rule, however, there were problems and we see the Maccabean revolt happen about 167 BC. Um, um, Antiochus. Mm -hmm. Antiochus. Antiochus, I always want to put the emphasis on the long syllable. Um, mm -hmm. desecrated the Jerusalem temple by sacrificing pigs on the altar and dedicating it to Zeus. And uh, if you know a little bit about Jews, you know that pigs are the worst of worst animals. And Zeus was um, obviously uh, the top of a pantheistic uh, religion. And so we couldn't have gotten any worse. Uh, problem for the Jews and they said that's it we we're out of here and they tried to revolt um, so Ju Simon and Judas Maccabee led the results the revolt successfully that um, re-established Jewish control and we know that um, the festival of Hanukkah which happens around our Christmas time uh, commemorates that uh, revolt that successful revolt and putting Jews back in control of their own worship in their own temple. Um, the Greeks were taken over by the Romans and uh, they were absorbed. The Romans kind of did the same kind of thing that the Hindu folks did is they just kind of sucked up uh, the Greek understanding and they just changed the names of things. And they came into the uh, Middle East, into Canaan to supposedly settled disputes about the position of high priests. They were just going to come in and say, all right, you guys get your act together and <laughs> ended up staying. Uh, they didn't leave. And so the Jews were tolerated as long as they didn't cause trouble and as long as they paid their taxes. But you have to realize the taxes were exorbitant. I mean, absolute abuse. We, we whine and complain about ours. Oh, but they were nothing compared to what the Jewish uh, government, I'm sorry, the Roman government put on the Jewish people at that time. Under Roman rule, um, groups developed around how uh, Jews should deal with Roman occupation. There was the Sadducee, they were pretty conservative. They rejected everything but the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, and they tended to cooperate with the Romans. On the other end of the scale, we have the zealots who their only desire was to get the Roman dogs out. And they were really more a political group than a religious group. So they identified more ethnically than they did religiously. There were the Essenes who sought to live a very pure life apart from the rest of everybody else until God's uh, time came and he would figure it all out and bring some final judgment. And then there were the Pharisees who sought to apply the Torah to all aspects of life and find some sort of middle ground between all of these um, other more extreme um, pieces of Judaism. Also under Roman rule, uh, the Jews, mostly the Zealots, revolted against Rome in 66 AD, and the Roman government uh, came in and said, all right, we've had it with you people, and they destroyed the temple, and they crucified so many people at the time that there weren't even hardly enough trees to make it happen, um, and again, the Jewish center of life around the uh, temple was uh, removed, um, taken apart, and uh, we ended up with the, the last breath, as it were, last hurrah at Masada, where there was a great um, attempt to take out the last of the Jewish leaders, and instead of being taken captive, uh, they killed, 
killed themselves. And again, the synagogue life re-emerged as central uh, to Jewish understanding of themselves and rabbis took the place of the priests. And just quickly, here's a um, picture of the Masada. They had all climbed this mountain and tried to uh, hold out there, but uh, when it was inevitable that the Romans were going to take siege of them, they, they decided to kill themselves. Um, um, so during this time, some teachings, written things emerged. We had the Talmud, which was the rabbinic teaching of uh, what was contained in the Torah and the Tanakh, which is the entire Old Testament. And then the commentaries, the Mishnah and the Gemma were, were brought in um, and as a part of that. And then we have the Midrash, which explains all the commentaries. Um, uh, and those teachings were carried on over centuries that way. And then there were these extra stories that came out about um, rabbinic understanding coming from the Babylon exile. And all of those things still take uh, precedent in uh, a Jew's training today, especially the rabbis. So here now we are at approximately uh, 500 BC, 600, I'm sorry, AD, 500, 600 AD. And so um, Jewish people began to exist in other cultures that were now being dominated by Christians or Muslims. And so again, I said their synagogue worship and Talmud teachings were the central part of their life together. Um, they became skilled business people and tradesmen because they had no land any longer. Um, the Muslims had taken over um, the Middle East, and so had Christians, and so they didn't have control of their own land any longer, and so they became these skilled tradesmen and business, business people, and that was both a blessing and a curse. It was a blessing for the society um, because they profited from their profit, but it was a curse because people became really jealous of their success, and that became a problem uh, for them in the years to come. During the Islamic period, where uh, Islam moved from Iraq, Iran, Turkey, and took over um, the Middle East, moved into Spain, uh, into Italy, into uh, Southern Europe, um, that became a time when uh, the Arabs had united under the teachings of Muhammad. And like I said, they began to conquer different areas, and they conquered Palestine in 636 AD. Um, the Jews um, and the Christians were, during the Islamic time, in um, the Middle East were basically kind of left to themselves pretty much until the Seljuk Turks started uh, demanding everybody convert, and this began the time of hostilities between the Jews and the Christians and the uh, Muslim people. And um, the Crusades then began in 1097, and they were actually a response to this action of the Egyptian Muslims to try to force conversions. And if you want to read something that's fairly easy to get a sense of what the Crusades were really about, um, I would recommend this book, the first few chapters of that. Um, both the civilization, civilization of the Middle Ages, because uh, we're usually told today that, oh, us nasty Christians went in and messed up the Muslims. Well, actually, the Crusades were a response to the Muslims moving in uh, to the Middle East and then uh, insisting on conversions. Um, the state of Israel, so that takes us from about um, the late 1000 to you know, 1000 uh, AD into the middle part of the 1900s. Um, and you all will know perhaps the story pretty well, at which time after World War II, part of um, the end of that whole process was to establish the modern state of Israel in 1948. 
Um, this was recommended by an Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry. Uh, however, uh, when they did this, there was no um, partition partitioning of Palestine at that point, and the Jews from outside were allowed to uh, have immediate access to the uh, state of Israel uh, as quickly as they could come, and they came flooding from all, all parts of the world um, to reestablish their homeland. Um, and this was partly the uh, response at the end of World War II to try to uh, make up for, if you will, the Holocaust. However, it's important to remember that the way this was done and the way this was established, um, nobody was really satisfied with that whole deal. And so uh, some of the issues that are present with us today have their germination in 1948. And we can have a discussion about that at some point if you want. So that was, did I make it? 4,000 years in 400 seconds. Uh, mm -hmm. Not quite. Um, anybody want to ask any questions? I just think it was a good try. Okay. <laughs> Did a good job. Thank you. Anybody else want to question? Okay. Well, um, I have a quick and, one. Sure. What's the difference between the Orthodox Jew and the regular Jew. Okay, that's what we're going to do next. So good oh, question. Okay. Excellent lead in. Thank you so much. I have a question, Patty. Sure. Uh, the taxes that the Jewish paid, you said it was, you know, a pretty high tax rate. Right. Was it higher again uh, in that area than the rest of the Roman world? Or was Ooh, did the Romans have question. pretty much high tax rates everywhere? You know, Patrick, I don't think I can answer that question. It was high for the Jewish people because it kept them in a constant state of poverty. So um, I don't know if they had more resources or less resources than other parts of the world, but the Romans had a pretty top heavy government. And so it took a lot of money to keep it going. So I would suspect that their taxes were pretty high for everybody. I'm just thinking that you're not discriminated against if everybody is taxed equally. Yeah, although it is, it feels discriminatory certain. if you don't know what other people are paying and you can't really afford to pay it yourself. Mm -hmm. Sounds like something the Romans would do anyway. Yeah, yeah, they were, they were, they tended in the early stages of their time from um, the beginning of the Roman Empire in about uh, one, 200 BC to roughly 200 AD. They were pretty brutal people. Yeah, they, I have another question too, but you can defer it to later if you want. Okay. When, the, when the Jews were slaves in Egypt and God says, I have heard their call, their, their prayers. But then when Moses gets there, he says, what, what's your name? So my question becomes, which God or what name of God were they using before they knew about the I am? I can't answer that question either. I would assume um, that they had lost the name of God in, in the time of transition from Canaan to Egypt in their time of slaves. And that's why it had to be reestablished because God doesn't give himself any other name other in any place in scripture to my recollection. Does that sound about right to you, John? Yeah, and the Jews, um, be before the Exodus, uh, really weren't very good at passing it to the next generation. In fact, mm -hmm. you even see that uh, during the time of the kings. If you read the time of the kings, you see one king who loves the Lord and his kid doesn't even know who God is. Um, so it would not be unrealistic to um, recognize that over that several hundred centuries or few centuries that, um, that the people lost any sense of who God really was. I, 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 that's okay. I did. I expected it to be a rather complicated question. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, they they weren't truly monotheistic until the time of the Ten Commandments, where they after they got out of Egypt. Abraham was. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He recognized there were other gods, but he was going to put himself at the top of the heap, and so they were probably worshiping, like you know, with their construction of the the golden calf. Yeah. A yeah. lot of Baals and other local gods I, that they worship. I do well. think what you're you're saying there is true that they um, they were in a culture where there were lots of other gods and the possibility of worshiping other gods was extremely prevalent and um, both um, Abraham and his descendants, we, we don't find any uh, evidence of them worshiping other gods. They, they were monotheistic that way, but having to carve it out as there really aren't any other gods their development of that experience doesn't come until later. Of course, you. if you and I uh, are, are um, not Christians, let's just say we're not Christians and we're polytheistic and we have God for the, you know, the kitchen sink and a God mm -hmm. for the refrigerator, which could be possible to be under some religions, um, and somebody comes in and says, there's only one God, it would take me a while to realize what I'm worshiping isn't real. So I think that's partly where that comes from. So that kind of does also come into this next section on the beliefs and practices uh, for um, the Jewish understanding of things. Um, I can get my slides to go. Here we go. Oh, <clears throat> Judaism is primarily a religion of actions. This is what Jews will often say about themselves. Characteristically, it has emphasized proper obedience to God over proper beliefs about God. So that kind of underscores what we're going to talk about next. So some of those key beliefs are these. I talked about this earlier, the establishment of the Shema. Every Jewish child learns to say say this prayer almost as soon as they can say mommy or daddy and that is this Hear, O israel the lord our god is one the lord alone is god and that comes from uh, deuteronomy and so in this sense they are a, a monotheistic culture or a religion um, and that was so different than anything that surrounded them that it's pretty miraculous that they were able to come to this um, and there are lots of people who say well of course God's self-revelation to Abraham and his follow his descendants would make that possible but just on the human level you need to consider what a huge leap this was from um, many gods to just one and that's a big deal that's really a big deal they also believe that Jesus is not the Messiah uh, whose coming was foretold in Isaiah. They still believe in the Messiah, but Jesus is not the Messiah. He's a great teacher, but not the Messiah. Uh, they also believe that their ethics uh, must reflect uh, God's own nature. God is a very uh, ethical type of being, has ways of treating people and expects people to do, this, do the same. So here's to your, your question about what's the difference between Orthodox and other Jews. So there are some expressions of uh, Judaism. We could call them denominations. First one is Orthodox. Second one is Reform. Third one is Conservative. Fourth one is Reconstructionist. And the last one is uh, Zionism. So I'm going to move through these fairly quickly and camp out on a few places that I think you'll be a little more interested in. First of all, Orthodox Judaism um, emphasizes submission to God's laws and um, the revealed will of God is absolute and not to be tampered with. And we find the revealed will of God in the Torah. Um, the book of the law is divinely revealed and it's accurate. There's no question about that whatsoever. And in the um, in the Old Testament, we find ceremonial law, and we also find ethical law, and for the Orthodox Jew, both are binding. They're equal. 
You can't put one above the other. Um, and that looks like um, um, this. Uh, their communities are very distinct and they keep themselves separated from outsiders. Uh, men and women are separate during synagogue worship, men on one side, women on the other. Uh, if you know anything about Quakers, you'll know that Quakers follow the same rules, men on one side, women on the other, so that um, um, we don't distract each other during uh, worship. Men wear a kippah and a teflon, which are mandated in the Old Testament. And um, that uh, signifies that you are always under the watchful eye of God. Um, the exact phrase is bind them around your arm and, he and head as a witness to yourself. That's the, the quotation out of Deuteronomy. Further, um, Orthodox Jews follow co uh, kosher dietary laws. I was going to bring something uh, to demonstrate that, and I forgot, and I apologize. But the next time you look at when you're, you know, go in your kitchen and look for this, um, the labels on your food, if they are kosher, they will be marked with uh, a K in a circle or sometimes a U. Um, all fruits, nuts, and vegetables are K. Uh, they're kosher. Fish with fins and scales are K. Uh, meat from a split hoof animal that chews its cud is also kosher. Um, that means that beef is okay and pork is not. Um, ritual slaughter, however, is necessary for meat to be considered kosher. And that is, they have a, a, a way they consider that to be kosher. Um, and I'm not entirely privy to that, but it has something to do with the proper draining of blood from the carcass. Um, dairy is permitted, but not with meat. So if you're having a hamburger, you cannot put cheese on it. Sorry, wrong. Um, if you're having a hamburger, you can't mix it with sausage. That makes it unkosher. So meatloaf that's a mix of, of uh, pork and beef is out of bounds. Um, and uh, Orthodox Jew will have a kosher kitchen. I babysat when I was a, a teenager for an Orthodox uh, Jewish couple, and it was kosher. Um, there, it's basically two kitchens. On one side, they have one set of dishes for dairy and all that kind of stuff. And on the other side, they have dishes and preparing things um, for meat. And in the little corner, they had a little ice box, a little small refrigerator for me or anybody like me that came in that was a Gentile to watch the kids. And you could have anything in that refrigerator. And they got really upset with me when I wouldn't eat anything out of it because they couldn't eat it. Once it was in that refrigerator, they couldn't eat it. So the food would go to waste if they couldn't find somebody to give it to. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I was never as well treated by anybody I babysat <laughs> before as I was those people. I mean, there was anything you could think of in that refrigerator. Um, and it was wonderful. But um, I was not supposed to touch anything else in the kitchen. If it needed to be touched, their son uh, would take care of it. Well, did I came to babysit? Um, they uh, um, will okay certain prepared foods, but again, they need to be marked with a U or a K and a little uh, circle somewhere on the package they can find it. Um, keeping God's commands before a person is important, and the body is as holy to them as the spirit uh, that inhabits the body. So those are that's the kind of sweep of Orthodox Judaism, um, and and they they are in um, all the major cities of the United States. They you will find Orthodox Jews. Reformed Jews, on the other hand, are a little bit different, um, not entirely. They still believe in monotheism. They practice the Shema. They believe that the moral rules are constant. They should not be changed. However, everything else can be uh, changed or um, modified as circumstances require or, or as needed. And so they give the individual conscience uh, quite a bit of uh, importance there. They rely on that. Um, the moral law is binding, not the ritual law. You find it helpful to your worship, 
great. If it um, becomes a burden, then it's okay to not put uh, any emphasis on that. Um, in Jude Reformed Judaism, families sit together in the synagogue, and uh, the place of worship is called a temple, not a synagogue. So if you're looking in the phone book or on the internet, and it's, um, what's the one in Spokane up on the South Hill? Um, Beth, temple Beth Shalom. Right. So what will that tell you? It's a reform. It's a reform. Temple. It's a reform uh, Judaism uh, group. Uh, they often use in English entirely in their services, whereas Reform will often have some Hebrew that people learn uh, as children so they can participate. Uh, they don't usually wear ritual garb unless it's for a, a special service or something. Um, and they um, do have some rituals, but they don't um, practice them rigorously. And they were among the first group to... Um, ordain women as rabbis and to institute a coming of age for girls. Uh, the coming of age for boys is called a bar mitzvah and for girls it's called a bat mitzvah. Uh, quickly, conservative uh, or Judaism follows kind of a middle road between orthodoxy and reform uh, Judaism. Uh, it was formed as a kind of a reaction against some of the excesses and really lax stuff going on in re reform uh, Judaism. And their desire is to be as fully Jewish and as fully American as possible. Um, and so therefore, uh, they're de dedicated to preserving the historic parts of Judaism uh, without utter refusal to accommodate um, modern needs. Into that we have quickly, oops, what happened? We have the reconstructionism of Judaism. It's another attempt to unify Judaism in America. Um, Judaism should be thought of as an evolving religious civilization in their mind. And therefore the focus is Jewishness in all of its forms, religious, ethnic, and cultural. Um, only form of Judaism that was produced solely in America. And then we have lastly Zionism, based on the importance of the Jewish people as a nation, not just eth ethnically, but as a, a nation among nations. Um, they tend to be mainly non-religious. They don't put a great emphasis on their religious beliefs. However, um, they do... Um, um, and put some emphasis on orthodoxy because it supports their desire to be a nation. And so they're similarly favored by most conservatives. Um, they're only supported by reformed Jews after uh, the Holocaust, uh, which was the attempt to wipe out the Jewish people. Okay. And you all are, um, I'm sure, quite uh, familiar with the Holocaust. It means burnt sacrifice. Um, these numbers are being changed in modern history. At one point, they thought there was approximately 6 million Jews eliminated during World War II by Hitler and other groups, uh, but especially by Hitler. But I read recently where, uh, because the, they tried so hard to um, eradicate Jews, it could have been as high as 8 million. Um, so the reasons that uh, we, that people have come to this is that there's a religious reason to remember uh, the events that happened in the Holocaust. Um, the idea of trying to wipe out you know, the Jewish understanding of God. Um, there was a practical reason to remember so it doesn't happen again. We don't allow those kind of things. And then, of course, a moral reason, the extermination of people simply because they're of a particular ethnicity uh, is completely immoral. Um, there are some festivals that you might want to do, and I just, I don't need to go through these in great detail, but there's some major ones, Rosh Hashanah, Ram, uh, Yom Kippur, Hanukkah, Passover, uh, Shavuot, and Sukkot, those are the major ones. And then, of course, the, the most recent one, uh, the Holocaust. 
Um, their general beliefs are, again, God is one. There's one God, God is one. There's no division in God. The great Shema gives us that. Uh, ways of relating to people cannot be separated from the ways of relating to God. And we get that out of the prophets. All people fall short of this goal. And that's where we get the concept of sin. It's out of Judaism. People are not to exist in isolation, but to gather together. Uh, they believe in the Torah, which is the law, first five books of the Old Testament. Um, and people, believe, the Jews believe that God reveals God to people in the Torah. Then there's the Tanakh, which is the rest of the Old Testament, which is the whole of the Jewish Bible. Um, I was going to try to find our copy of the Tanakh, and I realized it was in a box somewhere in the storage unit. So that's fine. Mm -hmm. I need to get it out of there. Um, the Talmud contains the commentary on the Tanakh and the, com the Ten Commandments then are the basis of the Torah. Uh, everything else revolves around the Ten Commandments. Uh, the people of Israel are one people. So if you live in New York, you're a part of the people as much as if you live in Seattle uh, or Spokane. The people of Israel um, they understand themselves to be the chosen people. Uh, that implies for them responsibilities. Um, it does not necessarily imply rights or privileges, but um, they have gotten that mixed up um, periodically in their history. And um, they will often say to each other a phrase that translated in, uh, into English comes out next year in Jerusalem because their hope will be that one day temple worship uh, will be established again in Jerusalem, and they will go when that happens. Um, and then quickly, I can't uh, do, in, do uh, justice to this without um, making some comment about anti-Semitism uh, that is um, in many estimations on the rise again. Um, and it comes from erroneous beliefs that Jews were solely responsible for the death of Jesus. And it comes from historical factors, which were the early church did not permit usury, that is to charge interest for money. Um, but because Jews had a banking system and they had dollars to lend, they were often associated with this usury. And so uh, there was a a move against Jewish people um, because of that. And that early discrimination then became ingrained in a couple of major um, things. One is called the Protocols of Zion, um, out of which um, Hitler took some of his final solution um, insights, if you will. It's not a good word, but that's where he got it. And then the the Ku Klux Klan movement exacerbated those ideas and they have uh, given rise to this um, anti-Semitism as well. The um, white supremacy, if you hear that, if people are in favor of that, if somebody has uh, ideas about that, uh, that will include anti-Semitism. Okay, so <sighs> deep breath for me at least. Maybe Good you job. Good um, job. Uh, oh, may, we have a little more time this time for um, some questions, comments. Um, I, I have a question. Sure. So this may be the wrong time to ask this. I'm not sure. Um, what about the Messianic Jews? Okay. Uh, Messianic Jews are folks who... Um, to some level, some degree, um, accept Jesus as Messiah, but they want to maintain their Jewish roots, their Jewish uh, heritage, their cultural understanding, their religious understandings. And so uh, they will uh, hold their understanding of Jesus as Messiah into their Jewishness and accept that. They, they, are, okay. they don't join churches necessarily they have their own kind of church they have their their own what their own kind of church churches okay 
Yeah. Okay. I wonder where they meet in Spokane. I'm not aware. You know, we can here. ask Adam because Alicia's brother-in-law is a Messianic Jew. Mm -hmm. And she had, when they, when she married Alicia's sister, or he married Alicia's sister, she had to convert. Right. They will, they will hold very tightly to their Jewishness to the, and I, and whichever group, you know, who they are, they will have to make, they will make their own decisions about whether they're going to be kosher Orthodox Jews, or if they're going to be Reformed Jews, or how that works. They, that's why they're their own kind of group. Okay. Some of them find great um, um, inspiration in Orthodox mm -hmm. Judaism, others not so much. Good question. Wow. Others. Yeah. Well, Patty, I did some looking around, going all the way back to your first slide about the, uh, uh, if you're Jewish, you could be uh, religious or cultural or, or, what, or a combination of both. And the other day I was listening to a podcast called The Bible for Normal People. And somebody was on there talking about that and they gave a percentage of um, the, the kind of talked about that. So I looked it up and it said that uh, here in the United States in 2019 uh, of the Jews that were polled, 24% consider themselves religious Jews. 59% uh, was uh, cultural or, or ethnic. 16% uh, took them both equally, and then 1% had no opinion. So in the United States, it's, it's more of a, you know, a culture or an mm -hmm. ethnicity sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the talking about reform and conservative in the United States, 35% um, were reform and 18% were conservative. 10, only 10% 10 were orthodox. 30% uh, were the uh, reconstruction mm -hmm. and then the 7% were the kind of the Zionists and mm -hmm. kind of offshoot sorts of things. Yeah. And it, in Israel, it's, uh, you would imagine the numbers are different and they are, 58% uh, uh, consider themselves, consider Jewish, being Jewish to be a religious mm -hmm. commitment and 42% uh, believe that it's secular. And in the United States, <laughs> I'm almost done, bear with me. In the United States, uh, two thirds of, of those surveyed say that you can be Jewish without believing in God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and you can, because by birth, you, you can be Jewish oh. by your gene pool. Mm -hmm. And any of us women who have been in for our yearly exams, we know we're asked, are we Jewish? because that affects uh, the, the numbers on those exams. Oh, wow. Yeah, hmm. so they're tracking that. So Jewishness, uh, um, um, having um, Jewish background, Jewish in your blood um, is a genetic trait. So it's conceivable, feasible, what the right word is, to be Jewish and see yourself that way ethnically without, without buying into the religion. And because of this, wow. is my opinion, my opinion, I think anti Semitism uh, makes people, uh, makes a lot of Jews unwilling to um, claim their religious heritage mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. dangerous. Right. Um, and um, there's, there's a lot of prejudice against Jews. Well, it, you know, especially for the, uh, like the Orthodox by wearing mm -hmm. the, the yarmulke, you know, mm -hmm. they're, you know, and wearing the phylacteries and things mm -hmm. like that. They're just setting, setting mm -hmm. themselves up by yeah. setting themselves apart. So, well, That comment kind of proves your stats from Israel. In Israel, the ethnicity uh, underlying stuff wouldn't be an issue, would it? No. Because, because by border, that's where you are, that's who you are. Yeah, yeah. So and those those numbers would be really skewed mm -hmm. in our two countries. Right. right. Almost by definition. And there are people who say, oh man, there, you know, there's not that much anti-Semitism. Oh, I beg to differ. Yeah. <laughs> um, those of you may have heard 
John and I, maybe Devin, speak of Lee Spitzer, who used to be the general secretary mm -hmm. for ABC USA. He's a converted Jew and became a Christian as a teenager. Um, but his family's Jewish, his, his whole family is Jewish. They're Jewish. And he uh, can give testimony to the fact that even amongst uh, fellow Christians, he's been um, treated badly, very badly, because he's Jewish. Yeah, I can only imagine. So uh, that brings me back to one of the things that um, is important for us to consider is, so there are people around us who have uh, Jewishness in their, either in their blood or their family history. How is it as Christians, as followers of Jesus, that we might offer Christ to them when uh, Christians have in the past treated them so badly? Mm -hmm. Do you think that the Messianic is a good bridge but for that question? The Messianic groups? Uh, perhaps. Um, but it doesn't let you and I off the hook, Patrick. It, I, I, say that again, please. It, uh, turning to our Messianic Jewish friends mm -hmm. uh, is good, but it doesn't let you and I off the hook. Oh, okay. That Can you wasn't, explain quite, that what wasn't you quite my that? question, but I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we still need to wrestle with how, how do we be Jesus to someone who has Jesus's heritage in their blood? Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I'm not saying there's an easy answer. I'm not putting you all mm -hmm. on the spot, but I, I really very much want you to consider that because it's important just as important as it would be to uh, find ways to witness to our hindu buddhist muslim neighbors jews are in that category mm -hmm. don't we all have jewishness in our blood do we all no, as uh, far back as it goes so the geneticists would tell us no I don't know what to do with that. Um, I suppose if you believe we, um, and I do, believe we all came from Adam, that may be true, but there's been so many um, years, thousands of years of human history that um, Jews, Semites, are a particular people. I, when I was in the Tri Cities, I was assistant city manager for Richland, Washington, and I was dating um, a Jewish man, mm -hmm. an Orthodox Jew. Wow. Yeah. His wife had passed away. And um, so that a lot of people assumed I was Jewish. Mm. And it was an interesting position to be in. And I really experienced a lot of the um, anti-Semitic activities that Stan used to run into. And, you know, Richland, particularly with Mattel there and some of the other industries are very, it's very, um, it's, it's international people from all over the world. You know, they're top scientists that are there. And it was quite interesting because I thought it would be a little more um, open about those things, but it certainly wasn't. Mm, wow, that's tough. Any other uh, comments or um, questions or, or statements you wanna make? Well, I've heard some people who are Jewish say that hell does not exist. Mm -hmm. So how, how do they get that out of the Old Testament that hell does not exist? Um, in Jewish older teachings, um, the concept of hell, uh, the, the terminology is, terminology is Sheol, yeah. um, and it refers to kind of a shadowy, shadowy waterland. Uh, they did not spend a lot of time speculating about hell. Um, 
and they were more concerned about living life in obedience to God now and trusting God for the rest of that, whatever that was later. Um, so they didn't spend a lot of time even thinking about heaven or paradise. Um, it was more a, a now time, a now issue. Uh, and so um, out of that, uh, there is the some thought that um, maybe hell does not exist for Jewish people and their, their thinking, their theology. I think I would disagree with that. They just don't spend a lot of time on it mm -hmm. like we might. I, I was thinking, are they afraid that the motivation for doing things right is so that you don't go to hell? Right. But be. if they don't have a hell, then what's the motivation for doing things right? Well, the motivation for doing the right thing is um, being the chosen person God made you as a Jew um, and, and not, not disappointing God, um, not being disconnected, alienated from God. Um, that's very important to them. That's why those rituals exist so that they can lessen the space between them and God. But it's very human to think that if there's no punishment for something, then, then, then what's the big deal? Sure, sure. Um, I, I wonder, however, if that isn't us as uh, modern Western thinking Christians uh, with our mindset of thinking cause effect, uh, consequences, um, both maybe now, but also eternally, uh, we're projecting that. Whereas for them, it was enough to uh, be uh, a Jew, a good Jew, following the rules in obedience to God. Um, because one concept, one teaching, especially in uh, Orthodox Judaism, but also Reform, is that your obedience to God and God's rules will bring the kingdom on earth. And without that, there will be no kingdom. So as they practice their um, beliefs, their understanding, their, their um, synagogue worship, their, a, 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 a Jew, a good Jew will, will memorize. I think I said this in a sermon at uh, Engage. A good Jew will memorize the entire book of Psalms, the entire book and go through uh, repeating part of it every day mm. from memory. Doing that is understood to usher in the kingdom so that that temple will appear in Jerusalem one day. That's your role in that. So when you don't do those things and you are further and further separated from God, you are keeping the kingdom, God's kingdom on earth from coming. That's a little, that's kind of a heavy, a heavy deal. That's a yeah, burden, yeah. But it also gives you a part to play in the coming kingdom. Good. You guys are asking great questions. I got another one. Okay. Oh, go ahead. You said that the word Holocaust means burnt sacrifice. Yes. What does the word show up mean? Show Cause up. Because every time you have a show, a television show about the Holocaust, the word show up keeps coming up. Mm -hmm. oh, um, I think that um, the Hebrew uh, the Hebrew phrase for Holocaust is part of that. Um, I think if you go back and look at those slides, um, the word for um Shoah is in that phrase and it's part of that Holocaust remembrance. And yeah, Yom Shoah, the day yeah. of, of Shoah. Yeah. Yeah. Day of remembrance, I, I'm guessing, yeah, that's probably what that means. I'm not sure if it means remembrance or if it's part of the burnt sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, How's Shoah spelled? S-H-O-A-H. -H. Yeah. Or A H, because if I typed in Shoa S H O W A on uh, <coughs> Google, yeah. it comes up in Wikipedia as a history of Japan. Oh, well, okay, 
<laughs> that's a little bit far stretched from Judaism. Yeah. Pat, were you yeah. watching that show in a different language? Yeah. No, <laughs> no I was spelling it. Or, oh, no. It's just that written as an old spell. Yeah. S O A H. S S H O A H. Yeah. yeah. yeah they've got, they have a big museum back in Washington, D.C. Yeah. DC called the Shoah Museum. Yeah. Where they have a big cylinder with all these shoes in it. Yeah. They're taking out of Queen Victoria. Everybody who has been there says you should go once, but that's about all you can take. Mm -hmm. Did any of you see the KSPS special a few months ago on the Holocaust? If you have passport, if any of you contribute and have access to passport, be sure to go in and watch that. Okay. Good. It, is, it is worth your time to watch it. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, rehab with my leg, um, and I'll just take a short minute here. When I had my leg amputated, I went to Seattle, and my girlfriends that went with me worked for the state uh, as caseworkers, and they got a hold of caseworkers, and they were told that if they could get me into this one particular rehab place, um, that was the place to be. Well, it turns out it was um, a lady had needed a rehab place. Her husband had it built for her. They were Orthodox Dox Jews. And only Jewish people could go there. It was on the end of Lake, uh, south end of Lake Washington. Beautiful setting, perfect. Both of the, neither of the kids were Jewish. The son ended up in a terrible car accident needing extensive rehab. So they built a wing for non-Jewish people. So somehow my friends got me in there mm. for my rehab on my leg. And they had the two kitchens. Mm -hmm. But see, I didn't know it was Jewish when I went in. So <laughs> and I went in during Hanukkah. Oh, oh, oh. And so all the food was coming Jewish. <laughs> for a while so they finally said oh we do have a regular kitchen too mm -hmm. but my friends would come my niece came to visit me and and she wanted something to eat and I didn't have anything handy and I said well there's some uh, machines food machines down the hall and you can go down there well they had taken and closed them all off because they didn't want people going there <laughs> so she couldn't even get anything in those machines but the I, I learned to love matzo ball soup. I loved it by the time I left there. Okay. It, the facility was absolutely, I think, one of the best facilities I've ever seen or have been in. Many times the smell that you have in, in a facility, a rehab facility, is not the best. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, the care and the cleanliness and the, the work that I had to put in I've never worked so hard in my life, mm -hmm. and it was a fantastic facility. Yeah. Oh, great. Cool. Really good. Yeah. Well, we are at our, our time. Uh, Pastor Devin asked me to give you his regards. Uh, they had uh, company this evening, and um, folks are considering um joining the church so i'm sure he would appreciate our prayers as wow that's pretty cool yeah so any other uh prayer requests 